Great evening, welcome, welcome. I'm Marco Lurie, Senior Manager for Strategy and Visitor Engagement here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, Living Memorial to the Holocaust. I welcome you to tonight's program, Testing Faith, Unpacking Testimonies of Ukrainian Rest Rescue Work. We're very pleased to welcome Raisa Zalaslapenko as tonight's speaker. Raisa will draw from her work with primary source testimony from Ukrainians to explore why some marginalized groups across Ukraine we're more likely to empathize with persecuted Jews. This is fascinating research, and after Raisa's presentation, there will be an opportunity for an audience Q&A, so I encourage you to save your questions. I do want to note that this is the launch of our fall season of programming, and I welcome you to view our full program schedule, which we just posted at njhnyc.org backslash events. Thank you so much. Raisa. Definitely a viable one. 
primary testimony offers an even more intriguing perspective. It was the philo Semitic underpinnings of some members of the fundamentalist Protestant denomination to question that provided a broad theological basis for rescuing Jews. And this broad theological basis transcended the socio-political phenomenon of the common dog mentality. And it even transcended widespread ecumenical obligations for being a good Christian. And by ecumenical obligations, I mean a sense of humanitarianism, a sense of Christian duty to love thy neighbor, you know, the traditional uh, concept of uh, Christianity. Um, okay. Uh, the philosemitism was not restricted to any branch of fundamentalist Protestantism, nor can it be said with scientific certainty that any branch was more disposed to such sentiments than any other. Though several denominations, such as the Baptists, did have a clear statistical advantage with regard to sheer influence of philosemitic rescue. Um, even then, philosemitism was most certainly not universally espoused by all members of any denomination, regardless of ranking, and that's an extremely important caveat. There were plenty of Protestants who were unfortunately anti-Semitic, and there were plenty of Protestants who stood by as bystanders, or possibly, though I haven't encountered specific stories, but statistically it's, it's probable that there were plenty of perpetrators amongst all populations, as there always were, sadly. Okay, so before I proceed to the very exciting testimony, um, I'm just going to delineate important theological basis for historic anti-Semitic prejudices, consciously no non-theological basis for um, historic anti-Semitic prejudices. Um, and then I'm going to look at primary testimony. Um, so the main thesis of this paper, okay, so these are my main theses. And the fundamental thesis, which is very exciting for me, is that the religious education received by members of certain minority Protestant groups often paired with a high probability of being brought up in philosemitic households cultivated a profound affinity for the Jewish people and a sense of obligation to rescue them from Nazi persecution. I also highlight how the exegetical focus of Protestantism better aligned the religion with Judaism in the minds of these particular rescuers. And by exegetical focus, I mean um, their tradition of going to the scripture and analyzing it in an intimate manner in, in very small groups at home. This tradition that is a very Protestant tradition, especially a fundamentalist Protestant tradition, better aligned the religion with Judaism in the minds of these particular rescuers. Because to go directly to scripture as a source of divine authority <coughs> is in many cases to go to the Hebrew Bible. And a very important clarification, I make a point to distinguish between those Protestant rescuers whose desire to help stems exclusively from Judeophilia, which is what I'm focusing on, and those whose primary motivations were um, proselytizing, meaning they wanted to convert the Jews to Christianity. And I will explain precisely why anyone would want to convert the Jews to Christianity if they were fundamental, if they're just any Christian. Okay, great. Um, Um, during the Nazi occupation of what's today Ukraine, anti-Jewish sentiment in the ethnic Ukrainian Christian community could be attributed to a number of factors. Um, largely classified as either non-theological, so economic and either political and theological, though the two weren't necessarily mutually exclusive. You could be, you could have a foot in both. Um, some manifestations of anti-Semitism may have been transitory, meaning that they appeared suddenly and without precedent in previously unprejudiced Ukrainians these Ukrainians seeking preferential treatment under the Nazi regime. But today I'll focus on anti-Semitic prejudices that are traditional. Um, so amongst the non-theological factors, well, this is an example of propaganda in support of non-theological factors. Okay. Um, so amongst those were historic Jewish leaseholding, especially in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, where Jews acted as financial middlemen between Polish landowners and poor Ukrainian peasants. Conspiracy theories claiming Jewish plans for economic domination also circulated as early as the Middle Ages. And in the modern period, this idea of a corrupt capitalist, money-loving Jew, scheming to inhibit the social mobility and prosperity of non-Jewish neighbors, stood in irrational 
rational contrast to another anti-Semitic myth, that of the socialist Jew out to destroy existing society from the inside out, a concept that was generously exploited by the Nazi propaganda machine. Um, there is also the idea that Jews were at the forefront of communist movements worldwide, and that they had betrayed Ukrainian freedom fighters to the NKVD, which was the secret police, that they were responsible for repressive actions such as decolonization and cult uh, collectivization. However, the most deeply seated anti Semitic sentiments were arguably felt by those Ukrainian Gentiles who, like their counterparts across Europe, upheld any number of century old theologically influenced beliefs. The most prominent being the early notion that the Jews had been responsible for the betrayal and the death of Jesus Christ. So later theologically influenced beliefs included medieval accusations of post desecration, the well poisoning, and the blood libel. The latter of which maintained the Jews were kidnapping and crucifying Gentile children to harvest Christian blood for ritualistic use. Does everyone see this? Um, furthermore, as was common across Christendom, many Gentile communities and individuals in Ukraine espoused supersessionist theological views. Now, supersessionism is a fascinating concept. Um, supersessionism maintained that Christians had succeeded or replaced the Israelites as the holders of a covenant or a special relationship with God. You know, the covenant of Abraham. So basically, when Christianity arose, that the Christians were the ones who inherited that tradition, basically rendering the Jews redundant. Now, this premise that the Jews had been replaced could be traced back to the first century, and particularly to the writings of Apostle Paul. Saint Paul, unlike his predecessors, the twelve primary disciples of Jesus Christ, did not represent Christ's teachings as a part of Judaism. Instead, he chose to spread Christianity to non-Jewish populations in the Mediterranean. In his Epistle to the Galatians, wrong order, this is St. Paul. And this is a, a, a painting of him uh, painting the Epistle, well, writing the Epistle to the Galatians. He spoke out against Judaizing Christians and argued that salvation could be achieved without adherence to Mosaic law. This meant that you could be saved without practicing circumcision, without keeping kosher. By accentuating what he received, perceived to be the Jews' preoccupation with the material and the bodily, Paul set a precedent of defining Christianity as separate from Judaism for the very first time, thereby marking the start of the split of the two religions. And this was quite a while after the crucifixion of, of Jesus Christ. Finally, in certain Gentile communities, there was the idea that the Jewish refusal to convert to Christianity had impeded the redemption of humanity, and that the Jews' conversion in the, quote, last days before the judgment would be necessary for the second coming. This idea came from the writings of Augustine of Hippo, whom we know as Saint Augustine. Um, so you might be wondering, if the Jews' refusal to convert was such a major impediment to Christianity, why even bother tolerating the existence of Judaism? You know, why not convert everyone en masse? Well, Augustine's writings also offered an explanation as to why the Jews were allowed to coexist with the Christians. Augustine reimagined the Jews for the first time as witnesses to the doctrine of the Church. He basically depicted the Jewish people as the subjects of what religious historian <coughs> Paul Friedrichsen calls punitive wandering and divine protection. So you might be wondering what these ideas have to do with today's lecture on philosophic Christ and rescuerism in Ukraine. <coughs> Actually, these ideas are very important. And the reason they're important is that they explain why, despite the very compassionate doctrine of their faith, certain rescuers, certain Christian rescuers, including in Ukraine, did display anti-Semitism during the Second World War, and why some Christians even collaborated with the Nazis as perpetrators of anti-Jewish violence. But a very small minority of Christians across occupied Europe found the courage to rescue Jewish victims of the Holocaust. A 
Okay, faith motivated rescue work. So in my research, I refer to Gentiles who either attributed their rescue work to a sense of religious or spiritual ob obligation or a sense of inspiration as faith motivated rescue works. Some historians and sociologists use the term religious rescue works to describe such individuals. But I believe that the term faith motivated rescue work is more inclusive because the term religious rescuer can imply an adherence to religious tradition. In reality, though, primary testimony provides many examples of faith-motivated rescuers who were not especially religious in the traditional sense, or who practiced their faith in the privacy of their homes, or who simply adhered to the tenets of the Judeo-Christian tradition as a life philosophy. And let's remember that a lot of these Ukrainians who lived under Soviet occupation for approximately 20 years before the Nazi occupation lived in an atheist society. So many of them did practice if they did, they did so clandestinely. Um, some historians have suggested that access to institutional facilities and resources enabled clergy to be more successful rescuers than lay people because churches, by their very function, were accustomed to accommodating people. Um, despite numerous examples, however, of successful church-initiated rescue operations, institutional rescue was sadly not given in practice. Um, in fact, many clergymen and many vice were, were bystanders um, in the face of Nazi atrocity. As a general rule, across Europe, argued historian Timothy Snyder in his book Black Earth, churches that enjoyed a close relationship with the state before the war were not active in the rescue of Jews during the Holocaust. By contrast, argued Snyder, Christians who were used to tension with political authorities and with the surrounding population tended to be more open to the possibility of opposing German policies including by means of engaging in rescue operations. Now, this is the case with some members of Ukraine's UNIA Church, or the Greek Catholic Church. Um, its head, Metropolitan Archbishop um, of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, Andrei Shevitsky, for instance, saved 150 to 200 Jews, mostly children, uh, with the help of nearly 500 monks and nuns. Shevitsky is remembered by many people as a noble rescuer today, but he was never recognized for um, his rescue work by Yad Vashem. And the reason for this is that his position towards the German occupants is considered ambiguous by some historians. Because he had two <coughs> incompatible desires. On the one hand, he wanted to prevent anti-Jewish violence. And on the other hand, he wanted to help the Ukrainian people gain political independence by way of tolerating Nazi occupation as a means to an end, which was evidently very problematic. So in Ukraine, as was the case across Europe, most faith-motivated rescue work um, was often attributed to this ecumenical Christian sense of duty to love one's neighbor or to act as a good Samaritan. Um, the same sense of Christian duty also held true for minority religions. Uh, Baptist rescuer Nikolai Kuchmi, for instance, wrote in a letter to Yad Vashem that when Shnerkos Sirota appeared on the Ukrainian's footsteps in a village of Tirkitsi, he couldn't turn Siroda away, thinking to himself, the Lord would never send away anyone who came to him for help. But looking beyond this Christian sense of humanitarianism, we also see that the underdog thesis is actually very valid concerning these uh, motivations of minority-led uh, Protestant work, uh, rescue work. Historian Timothy Snyder suggests that the members of these alienated groups could trust one another more than non-minority Christians minority groups were accustomed to seeing their homes as embattled outposts of truth in a broken world. Such inclinations could be observed, for example, in many French Huguenot communities that had been persecuted by French Catholics from the 16th century to the 18th. As just one case study, the Huguenot community of the village of Le chaumont sur Mignon rescued 5,000 refugees during the war, about 3,500 of whom were Jewish men, women, and children. And the people of this community, these Protestants, they could indeed trust one another because even though not everyone from this village rescued people, nor did people, not everyone from the surrounding villages participated in the rescue operations, not a single person ever informed against his or her neighbors. Um, and their own experience of persecution, um, this underdog mentality predisposed these particular rescuers to empathize with the Jews. And their leader, Pastor Andre, uh, Chocme was himself an underdog throughout his life. When the rest of the Protestant church in France upheld the idea that citizens had to had a duty to bear arms to protect their nation in times of war, 
Trocne had an uncompromisingly pacifist and nonviolent position. Oh, this is a mix of this case. This is uh, Trocne and his Italian wife, Magda. Um, so he was discriminated against over the course of his career, receiving assignments with delay, and only reluctantly was he permitted to serve marginal parishes, and the idea was that his dissenting voice wouldn't be heard, it wouldn't be widely heard, which was preferable. Um, and so, thankfully, the parishioners of this particular village, where he was assigned in 1934, proved responsive to his ideas because they resonated with his own beliefs. And he urged these practitioners to do the will of God, not of men, and advocated non-complacence with man-made laws that violated their Christian conscience. Now looking at Protestants in Nazi-occupied Ukraine, due to the forbidden nature of Protestantism in both pre-war Poland and in the Soviet Union, um, these communities existed not as proper churches, but as groups of believers. And this lack of institutional structure may have made room for greater spiritual intimacy and discussion between the faithful. Because these discussions were often clandestine and unchronicled, it's difficult to verify the precise sentiment any one such community could have had towards the Jewish people, and therefore impossible to determine whether this philosophism was a universal value. But it's definitely certain that from all of these Protestant groups, uh, reveal the same patterns that we see in other groups elsewhere, including this underdog mentality and sense of Christian obligation to rescue. Um, one particularity before we go into philosophism was that while most families, rescuing families across Ukraine, sought to conceal their rescue work from their neighbors, some rescuers from non-dominant denominations of Christianity, like the Baptists, brought their charges before the entire congregation and encouraged their wards to seek out other members, members of the denomination in question for help. A young Jewish girl called Hannah Kwasha, for instance, sought refuge in the home of devout evangelicals Mikhail and Alexandra Horupai in the village of Kuykiv in the Vinitsa region. After several weeks, the Horupai sent Hannah to neighboring villages in search of other evangelicals who could help her. Eventually, Hannah's wanderings led her to the village of Yanni, where she met Mati, Anna, and Tatiana Bogachuk, who too were evangelicals. Hannah presented herself as Korobai's granddaughter and was welcomed without question, staying with the Bogachuks almost continuously until the liberation. Now, this tendency to turn towards one community, the one community, may be one of the reasons why minority Protestants were also willing to legally integrate their charges into their families, but this wasn't unique to so in summary, underdog experience always went hand in hand with humanitarianism and the sense of Christian duty. But some of these rescuers, and I know I keep on saying this, I'm just teasing you, and I, you probably want to hear the primary testimony, but I'll get to it. But um, some of these Protestants did reveal a remarkable affinity and really a profound sense of love for the Jewish people, a love that derived from their faith and emerged as a primary motivating factor behind their rescue work. These are all of the possible um, motivations behind most of the prominent motivations behind faith motivated rescue work. And you see, we have Judeophilia, it's really a subset of all of the previous ones, all the way on the bottom of the list. Okay, so really quickly, linguistic challenges. So, primary testimony isn't always clear between the various groups of cults. Evangelical, Seventh-day Adventist, Sabbatarians. In fact, a lot of these words are used interchangeably. Sometimes it's justified. Why? For instance, Sabbatarians are called Sabbatarians because they, um, well, they adhere to the, the, the Sabbath on, on Saturdays. And um, Seventh-day Adventists happen to also adhere to the Sabbath. So they were an example of Sabbatarians. They were a very concrete example. It's like how um, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares, right? Okay, and um, so the point is, while all of these ideas, all of these different denominations definitely have very specific 
you know, doctrines, very specific interpretations of scripture, um, it's very difficult to determine precisely which particular group these people belong to because there is such a wide breadth of practices. And sometimes the Hashem identifies someone as a Baptist, and then I'm listening, I don't speak Hebrew, but when I'm listening to this testimony in Hebrew, and it says Baptist in translation on the screen, but the book clearly says Shtundisbe in Hebrew, which are a very specific type of, of Baptists in Ukraine who are actually influenced by Mennonites, who were German settlers to Ukraine, as opposed to, for instance, Baptists who became Baptists because they had been exposed to Baptist, the Baptist faith, because some of their representatives had gone to the United States, received a Protestant education there, and had returned to Ukraine to spread this uh, faith, this evangelical faith in Ukraine. And it, this is very important, though. This is important because because it's so difficult to trace the origins of any one community, and because all of these words are used interchangeably, this also prevents me from making any global conclusions about philo-Semitism. It also prevents me from tracing precisely why any, any denomination in particular felt philo-Semitism. Specifically, the reason that this specific group felt philo-Semitism as opposed to another group. There's also another idea that's interesting, um, the Calvinist notion of predestination. So the, union, the Russian Union of Baptists is said to have adhered to this Calvinist doctrine of predestination, which looked at the idea of salvation as something that was predestined. Now, interestingly though, most Ukrainian Baptists, um, m most Ukrainian evangelicals in general, had adopted the Arminianist model of salvation by the 1990s, suggesting that this Arminianist model had been spreading across Ukraine between the early 20th century and the 1990s, and the Arminianist model is that mankind actually has free will, whether to accept salvation or not. Why is this important? This is important because a basic principle of Judaism is that a human can gain God's favor by his own conduct. So theologically, if some of these evangelical rescuers had been leaning towards a more Judaic, let's say, understanding of salvation, this could also have increased the probability of them feeling a sense of affinity towards the Jewish population. Russian, 
across the Russian Empire in the early 19th century. And this contributed to what historian Nicholas <coughs> Great Vogel has called a religious ferment and an increase in people who could interpret and spread the Holy Scriptures. I mean, this sort of paralyzed, the, the parallels what uh, the press had done, the printing press with the Gutenberg Bible, you know, centuries previously. Um, so it allowed a lot of people to be reading this scripture in the privacy of their home. An important caveat, a close study of the Hebrew Bible didn't mean an acceptance of other Judaic literature, such as Kabbalistic writings or the Talmud, a sacred text. Nevertheless, many of the listening Protestant rescuers felt such an ardent fascination towards Jewish culture that they sometimes even learned Hebrew and read these non-biblical Jewish texts that I mentioned that weren't sacred to them in the original languages just for fun. And you'll meet one of these people. He's so exciting. Yavashem recognized Baptist rescuer. 
the Ukrainian showed me his Hebrew scriptures and sang several songs to demonstrate his deep philo-Semitism. One of the songs was the Israeli folk song, Hava Nagila. Doorstep of a 
of the Chadem family and asked for help fleeing the ghetto with her remaining family. Save our souls, she said to them. The Chadem would spend the night devising the plan, and in the morning, Anastasia and Valentin journeyed to the village by a horse-drawn carriage on the pretense that Anastasia was ill and wished to consult a ghetto doctor called Horoj. The intention was to then bribe the Udenrat with food and drink, put the charges, pull the charges out of the ghetto one by one, disguise them as Ukrainian peasants along the journey home. But rescuing in Ukraine, as elsewhere, was fraught with challenges, and there was little guarantee that these escaped go smoothly as the Chilean hearts had planned. This is what Valentin told me when I interviewed him. As Mama was leaving, she asked me to bend down because she was already on the ground and I was sitting atop the wheel of the carriage. He told me in an emotional interview. I bent down. She kissed me and her tears dripped down onto my neck. I remember it to this day. What if our plan would fail and Mama would never come back? And she said, my son, if twilight sets in and I haven't yet returned, don't wait for me. Go home alone. But Mama prayed. She prayed ardently. Her tears continued to fall onto my neck. I remember it to this day. I can't forget it. And in the end, everything worked out successfully. Our common God, Zebaot, arranged for everything. And then we rescued for nine months. Dressed as Ukrainian peasants, the wards were transported to the Chanel house by horse-drawn carriage and settled in a small hideaway built underneath the floorboards, which was heated from above by a nearby stove. The wards were permitted to surface at night to stretch their limbs. They earned their keep by needing goods that the Baptists then exchanged for food. But in Zina, even voluntarily shared a bed and ate with the family's charges, he said in our interview, which reveals the extent to which, again, he felt an affinity towards these people, and I, I can't be entirely certain what this affinity was based on, but it seems like he was just very enthusiastic to have them Jews in his house. Um, to this day, well, I wrote this paragraph before he passed away, but he attributed his family's commitment to the rescue operation as part of their acutely philosophic faith and upbringing. Judeo Philip rescuers believed that rescuing Jews was an honor. Aforementioned Baptist uh, rescuer Nikolai Kuchmin who along with his wife Olga rescued three Jews in the village of Teremitsi, um, along with their trusted neighbors, reflected on this sense of honor decades after the war. In a letter that um, Kuchini wrote to the director of the Department of the Righteous in Yavashem, I am very surprised that there exists, in fact, a people that considers every human life to be of such great value. Decades have passed since the war. My friend whom we sheltered has already died, yet people have not forgotten the mercy shown to him and want to know how it all transpired, he wrote. Remember, I don't need anything. I live my life honestly and await the day that my Lord summons me. And I thank the Lord. I thank him that he gave me the opportunity and that he protected me so that I might hide a person. What difference does it make who he is? The Jews are a chosen people, chosen by God. And indeed, we see the biblical scripture coming to fruition. God said, I scattered Israel and will assemble it anew. In addition to believing that Jews were the children of Israel, the Baptists and other minority Protestant groups, as noted Timothy Snyder, like to discuss the Bible and Zionism with their charges. This affinity for biblical discussion with Jewish words is best evinced in the story of 20 year old Fema Rosenfeld from Arabalika, also near the evening. In August 1942, the adolescent escaped from the liquidation of the ghetto in her native town and ran towards the Baptist community in search of food. By September, she came upon Philippe and Sofia Kotsubailo, nicknamed Konu, presumably because either Philippe, Philip himself, or his ancestors had at one time cared for horses. Uh, Baptist farmers in, they were Baptist farmers in Moichitze, Bolinia, who believed that rescuing was also a blessing from. 
One night, Faina had a dream in which she saw herself holding a Russian language Christian Bible and was made aware of a passage of particular importance. Upon waking, she found the Bible in her room and began searching for the necessary pas passage. When Philippe Konuk entered the room, Faina told him of her dream, and the rescuer, who knew the scriptures well, immediately found the passage in question in the book of I Isaiah. Impressed, Philippe took Faina to the Baptist meeting, a Baptist meeting that very evening. And there she read a sermon before the entire congregation in the nearby village of Mulino. Its members felt moved to save her. Rosenfeld was treated like family in the Queen's house and nicknamed Saint Theodosia by the congregation, which considered her holy. Though through Faina, the Baptist community extended its help to other Jews hiding in the forest, including 11 year old Masha Drazen, later Wolfstrom. From the, help, from the town of Kamin Karishki, whom Rosenfeld had found lying alone in the woods at the end of 1943, after the child's family had been murdered in Aktion. all 
distributed um, to various people. Uh, let, let's just stop there. Um, continuing to the next passage. So, um, Judeo-Philip wrestlers often occupied themselves with their charges emotional and psychological well-being, in addition to meeting their physical needs of sustenance and shelter. Aforementioned evangelical rescuer Tatiana Bokuchuk used to lend literature to her family's charge, Hanya Kwashan, to help her pass the time. Uh, Hanya wrote in her post-war testimony, Thang was the same age as I was. I sat either in the attic or in the pantry in dark places. Thang looked after me to help me remain calm. She used to bring me the Bible and the Book of Psalms. I loved to read and devoured everything. The Bible intrigued me and I began to pray, asking God to keep me alive and to protect the family that was rescuing me from evil. Now this might seem like an attempt at proselytizing to convert her to Christianity, but as it, I'll just establish, um, as some of you probably know, the Book of Psalms is actually the third part of the Hebrew Bible, and it belongs to both, it's part of the Judeo-Christian tradition, both the, the Jewish and the Christian, and most importantly, this charge never con converted to Christianity. She remained Jewish um, after the war. Um, this is a very important um, rescuer because in this landscape of Eastern Europe, rescuing was punishable by death. Not just of the rescuers, but of the rescuer's children. Uh, I've seen primary testimony that implied that up to 10 surrounding families would be murdered as well. Sometimes they were hanged in the village, made an example of, uh, in the center of the village or the town. Sometimes they were exterminated alongside their charges by gunfire. I assume that the gunfire was the most likely method of extermination. I'm sorry to use that word, but unfortunately that's the way that these people were treated. Um, I don't mean to offend anyone with it. Okay, so Baptist rescuer uh, Mifoidi Lahat also lived on a Hupet, which is a private farm, isolated from the village. It's, it's small, so the Hupet is very small, isolated, and we have a village. It's like a hamlet. A Hupet is a hamlet. Then we have a village, then we have a town, and then we have a city. So these people uh, lived in places that were barely accessible, and I know this because it literally took me three and a half hours to drive to one where if it were a normal road, it would have taken under an hour, and this is like in the modern era. So, um, okay, so this Baptist rescuer worked for a wealthy Jew in Molodimides before the war, and he met many Jewish locals. As devout Baptists, Lohatsky and his wife felt it was their duty to rescue the Jews, whom, uh, whom they believed were God's chosen people. During periods of depression and despair, Lohatsky encouraged the Jewish wards in his home and shared his belief with them that they would later reach the Holy Land, reads an account on the rescue operation on Yad Vashem's website, suggesting that the rescuer was conscious of and empathetic towards the Jewish hopes of Aliyah, um, a return to Israel, another indication of his Judeo -philia. By spring 1943, most of his guests had moved on, but two remained, only to be found by German soldiers shortly thereafter and instantly killed. During his interrogation, Lohatsky was asked whether he knew that rescuing was punishable by death. To which he replied, You can take my body, but not my soul. The Germans executed Lohatsky, burned down his house, and stole his livestock. Ksenia, his wife, and their children were left homeless and themselves went into hiding until liberation. As suggested previously, some Judeo-Philic Christian rescuers espoused pre-Pauline views of Christianity or adhered to Mosaic law in very varying degrees. Among such rescuers were Sabbatarians, those who observed the, the Sabbath, uh, particularly Seventh-day Adventists. Um, and adherence to Mosaic law gave these rescuers a sense of closeness to God and a corresponding sense of confidence that God would deliver them from any challenges that they encountered because of the purity of their faith and of their spiritual practices. My dear little Zenfa, whom I did not mention earlier, but I wanted to, um, and her husband, Vladimir, were such sabbatarians from Kiev. Vladimir was exiled to Siberia in the 1930s during the era of Stalin's repressions, and Nadezhda never heard back from him again. 
Amongst Lutzenko's Jewish acquaintances were three Gettysburg brothers. And in a very complex turn of events, one of these brothers tried to escape Kiev by train, but the train was bombed by the Germans, and he had no one to turn to other than Lutzenko. So he went to her doorstep and asked for help. In her Yad Vashem testimony, uh, Lutzenko wrote, I had faith that God would save both me and him because I adhered to the commandments that God conveyed unto Moses and Abraham and knew that he, meaning God, protected his righteous servants. Lutzenko gave Arkadi Gessler her husband's birth certificate, and when she learned that her char charge would be unable to obtain German identity papers without first presenting his Soviet papers, which you had to change status, she took the risk of actually placing a notice in the local newspaper, declaring the loss of her husband's identity papers, and appearing with this charge, pretending that he was her husband. So, Gettysburg hid in her cellar while awaiting the arrival of his new papers. After receiving them, he wanted to be independent, so he moved out, found a job as a Christian, pretending to be her husband, uh, started renting his own place in the city's outskirts, but in autumn 1943, he feared that his identity had been discovered or would be discovered, so he returned to her and hid in her basement for the remainder of the occupation. And the pair ended up marrying six months after liberation, because her husband, unfortunately, was, well, he never came back. And they spent at least 50 years together. While many faith motivated rescuers were vocal about their faith and God throughout their testimony, marginalized back a Protestant. Really like the Baptists because they're so fascinating. <laughs> um, so, many of these marginalized Protestant rescuers, especially Judeo Philip ones, consistently revealed a sense of ardent gratitude to God for the opportunity to rescue and spoke in a manner suggestive of a profound awareness of God's constant presence in their lives. This is something that I've identified in the testimony that even if there's only one little phrase that suggests that this person was Judeo Philip, the testimony is permeated with a sense of gratitude to God, with references to Him, um, just exclamations like, Oh God, Oh Savior. Um, and this really, I think the way I phrased it is the, really the only way I can characterize it a profound awareness of God's constant presence in their lives. And I think that this is uh, a result of both genuine gratitude and a habitual outspokenness about their faith. This outspokenness that they, this kind of desperate outspokenness that they needed to develop to defend their spiritual beliefs in the face of persecution. So, in conclusion, um, in conclusion, in Ukraine, just like the rest of occupied Europe, there were both theological and non theological anti Semitic prejudices historically. And these prejudices often prevented bystanders from becoming rescuers. Some Christians, however, were motivated to rescue by faith. Most of these faith-motivated rescuers acted out of a general sense of humanitarianism, like all other rescuers, but also acted out of a sense of Christian duty, precisely because they were faith-motivated rescuers. But a very small, yet remarkable, group of people from minority religious groups in any given country also acted out of the underdog mentality. And then, even going even further, zooming in, we have philo-Semitic rescuers who attributed their philo-Semitism to their faith. And this philo-Semitism derived from the particularities of the Protestant faith in the case of Protestant communities in Ukraine starting from the exegetical tradition, i.e. the practice of closely studying the Bible directly in order to understand God and his commandments without the need for priests as mediated practice. And this religious education, as well as an accurate, acute awareness of the Judaic origins of Christianity, as a result of a meticulous understanding of the Hebrew Bible, cultivated both a great love for the Jewish people and a sense of obligation to rescue them from Nazi prison. Thank you. Yes. I'm somewhat obsessed.
test with uh, statistics and like groups and subgroups. Um, I, I I don't okay. <laughs> um, when I was in Kiev uh, five and a half years ago, I had no conception that there was this non-Protestant population, a Protestant population, non-Orthodox uh, Christian uh, population, and I regret that I didn't seek them out more. But at the time during World War II, and perhaps today, it probably didn't change. Number one, what percentage of the population consists of these different groups? How many rescuers would you say were? Well, we'll never know because a lot have never come forward. And how many Jews would you guess were saved as a result? Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is precisely why I included this now, because I was hoping for a question like this. Um, okay. I'm a plant. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, okay. This is Reich's Commissariat of Ukraine, which is the Nazi occupation of Ukraine. Um, this is District Zelitsyan, which is today. This, which I, I can not remember now that it has both of them, so I tried my best. Now, this is District Delitian. Today, this is part of um, today. This is part of Ukraine, but during the war, it was part of Poland. Um, now, historically, these areas. This is a very complex geography, and I'll try to give you a nutshell. So, basically, um, over a period of time, these areas, Volynia and Podolia, and District Delitian, were part of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And um, so there was Catholicism in these areas. And then, after the partitions of Poland, and there were three of them, you know, Poland was stripped into numerous little bits. And so some bits were given to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is down here. And a lot of uh, other bits were given to, um, well, various places. But a lot of Ukraine, which was also part of Poland, went to the Russian Empire. Um, and so what happened was a fascinating process. Now, in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, you had uh, Polish landlords, whom I mentioned, you know, Polish aristocrats, all of whom were Catholic. And if they wanted to maintain their status in the Russian Empire, a lot of them had to accept orthodoxy. So you had all of these upper classes, you know, um, uh, Russifying, Ukrainianizing from, Pol from the Polish status to be integrated into the aristocracy here. But you also had orthodoxy forced onto the population. And you have a lot of abandoned Polish churches in this area. This area was part of the Austro Hungarian Empire, which is why a lot of the architecture in Lemberg, which is Lviv or Lvov, is Austro Hungarian in nature and very Polish. While well, over here you see more kind of architecture from um, the interwar period, it was just Polish, but a lot of architecture from the Russian Empire as well. So what happened was a fascinating process. Most of these people remained Catholic, but they were Greek Catholic, so they were Ukrainian Catholic. So it was Catholicism recognizing the Pope with, with the Byzantine right. So they kind of had a foot in both Orthodoxy and Catholicism. Over here you had mainly Orthodox Christians, over here you had Orthodox Christians with some exposure to Catholicism. And, and then a lot of the Baptists lived here. Some of the testimony I cited was from other areas. But a lot of them were here because there were also German populations here, Mennonites that exposed these people to um, some forms of Protestantism from Germany. And so you had all of these movements here. Now, about statistics. Um, of course, during the Soviet period, a lot of these areas were atheists in practice because religion was forbidden during the Soviet period. It was an atheist society. But um, what is interesting is that, so statistically, there are, I think, 2,621 recognized uh, Ukrainian rescuers, uh, not counting Poles, of uh, just Ukraine, ethnic Ukrainian rescuers in all of the areas that were occupied, in all of the areas where the Holocaust occurred that are not Ukraine. And um, I'm actually doing a statistical analysis of every single rescuer story, looking at 40 traits, 40 um, elements from each story, including religion and distribution of, of rescuers, and 
including distribution of successful rescue stories according to religion. But I'm not done, so I can't answer your question, but I do know that most of these people who lived in these areas during the war were Orthodox Christians, even if they weren't practicing because they, were, they had lived under communism for 20 years. Most of the people living here were, what, most of the people living here were Catholics because they'd only been exposed to uh, communism for two years and they were more open about their faith. They lived, well, this area was under the Soviets for 20 years. This area was actually under Poland, which was Catholic. So they're more vocal about their faith, even when I interview them today. The people here, when I ask them what their faith is, when I interview these rescuers, they say, well, obviously we're Christian. And I say, well, what type of Christian? What do you mean, what type of Christian? Real Christian, none of that, you know, like, the equivalent to saying none of that Catholic baloney, none of that Protestant baloney. So there's obviously an understanding of, you know, orthodoxy as being the actual correct form of Christianity there. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I tried. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that a particular Protestant government has uh, uh, rescuers and collaborators, accomplices, and bystanders. What percentage would you say are collaborators? What percentage would you say? I know you can't give an exact answer, but given your, your experience, what rough estimate would you say are the rescuers? Thank you. Um, okay, so in any locality, the majority of people were bystanders. Um, the majority of people. Now, what is a bystander? It's difficult to say. You know, um, some people say that if you if you don't vote in an election, you're basically going to go, right? Um, if you don't try to do something to help someone, you're basically just watching by. You know, in complacency. But um, what's fascinating, there's a, there's a, a priest, uh, Patrick Dubois, in France, and he has a team, Yahad uh, in Moon, that travel across Eastern Europe and they actually interview bystanders. And he's identified this category. He, um, he says people who were requisitioned. So let's call them requisitioned bystanders. Now, it's fascinating. Someone say the girl, the Ukrainian peasant, happens to have like a wagon or a crate or just something to carry things. And um, the Einstein's movement up here at his doorstep, you know, put him at gunpoint and say, you know, if you, if you don't help us uh, love some earth today, we are going to violate your daughters and then execute you. So the girl has the option of either collaborating or being executed and having his daughters violated. And so the girl goes and he helps them carry earth back and forth. And then it just so happens that this earth that he them carry actually came from a pit into which Jews were subsequently shot. So he spent the rest of his life thinking that he's a bystander. Is he a bystander? I don't know. Is he evil? I don't know. You know, what, what would you have done? It's really hard to judge. I think a good um, example is Primo Levi. Primo Levi was a Holocaust survivor at the Auschwitz. He was an engineer, Italian. He wrote this essay called uh, the gray zone. And he was speaking specifically about Jews in the gray zone. So basically, Jews who were perpetrators, Jews who did things that they shouldn't have done at Auschwitz, betraying one another just to survive. And he said that between the poles of victim and perpetrator, you actually had a gray zone. A gray zone which, in which you made choiceless choices. And these choiceless choices, that's a term that I didn't invent, it was uh, invented by another historian. And choiceless choices between one form of abnormal response and another. And this is really why I think that rescuers are so fascinating. Because in this landscape where everyone was acting in a way that was absolutely abnormal, not helping anyone, small percentages definitely actively perpetrating during, during the police forces in every single town, a lot of them volunteering, some of them volunteering because they wanted food. Some of them volunteering because they were nationalists and they wanted arms. But many of them, including in both of those categories, volunteering because they were anti-Semitic or because they had a lust for violence. Um, you have that. Um, and then, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but the point is that you have this like entire gray zone of people 
acting between both poles, and the rescuers are fascinating to me because it seems to me that rescuers were the only humans between these both poles who somehow carried a sense of morality that actually resembled the morality that we have in our everyday lives. You know, they were the only people who were saved from these choices, choices, in theory, if you look at it on a global scale. But even if you zoom in onto rescuers who were a minority everywhere, definitely, they are statistically insignificant. But even if you zoom into rescuers and you look at the choices that they have made, even the rescuers have shades of gray, even the rescuers operated in a gray zone, you know. If I understood you correctly, in the examples you gave, um, Jews went to appeal to these rescuers. They they went to have, the Jews went to them. Are there any cases where these non-Jews who you say love Jews or had an affinity to Jews actually sought out Jews to help?
growing up in a place where my parents were able to tell me a lot about the Holocaust in Eastern Europe and about World War II and the true atrocities that were occurring there, again, in all of their shapes and grace. Talking about rescuers who were very um, uh, few, statistically insignificant, and talking a lot about perpetrators, but really giving me this very big, very complex understanding of this human experience. And when I graduated from college, I wanted to become a journalist, so I just packed my bags to my, my parents to say, and moved somehow, not thinking, to Eastern Europe. Um, having no Eastern European documents, I just decided, you know, took a risk, um, just got a visa, and went to Moscow to be a journalist. And now that's a very weird decision, but the fact is that when I was there, I was shocked by the extent to which my understanding of the war was inconsistent with the understanding of the war in Russia. My understanding of the war is inconsistent with the understanding of the war of certain very Ukrainian nationalistic communities in Ukraine. It's also inconsistent with a lot of you know, remnants of Ukrainian Jews who are very Sovietized. It's inconsistent with so many people because everyone has their own experience, their own perspective, that's normal. But beyond the normal you know, breadth of variation and understanding, you also have the politics of memory. And you have propaganda. You have blatant propaganda. And I get that the person who started out in journalism might have a very um, unsatiable quest for truth. I think it's very unjust that a lot of these stories haven't been told. Um, the Soviet Union denied the fact that many Jewish victims of the Holocaust were actually Jewish victims. And there's this statement in Russian and Ukrainian that every single town had its own body yacht. Which everyone knows the Bagi Yad in Kiev, you know, 33,000 Jews massacred. But every single locality in Ukraine, in, in uh, many of the areas of the Baltic states, in Belarus, some parts of Romania, everywhere where the Einstein Kruger came and murdered people has a Bagi Yad. And yet on the sides of these people's graves, you sometimes have a small little monument saying, here lie innocent Soviet citizens targeted by the fascists or the Nazis. And this was all part of this um, moral political uh, unity that the Soviet Union had established. And the reason for that was to, you know how you have, you have the fascists and you have the, uh, the capitalists and you have the communists, and they're all battling one another. And the idea was to show that the Soviet Union was universally targeted by the fascists, that the people were indiscriminately murdered because communism was made to look so bad in the eyes of the fascists. But the reality is that the Jews were targeted. The Roma were targeted, psychiatrically ill were targeted, um, homosexuals were targeted. These people were targeted and their graves remained unmarked because of someone's need for propaganda. And when I travel to Ukraine, I usually try to, when I interview these people, I try to you know, collect with a local historian in advance just to make sure that I know where I'm going. But on a few occasions, I just arrived in the town randomly and happened to find an elderly person and spoken to that person. These just gates opened up and all of this flood had just, just came, just, just comes running. And these people have so much trauma that has never been worked through. But just one example, I went to the town of Khmeini. And in Khmeini, which is a very important town, um, here is the Khmeini region. This is the, well, this is the uh, rice commissary in Ukraine regional distribution, but there is a region called Vinyasa that's very important. It's a very, um, Vinyasa region populated by Jews, and then the Mecca, which is here. And then the Ukraine is an important town there, and there are a lot of Jewish doctors, lawyers, and you know, shop owners, very intelligent, educated people, and people who are less privileged, but all, you know, this is not a show. But it's just shadow, of course, was complex. It wasn't just Jews. You know, there were Ukrainians, there were Poles, there were Russians, everyone living side by side. And I came there, and this one Ukrainian woman, I asked her because I knew that there was a, um, I knew that there was a, a house I was looking for, but there was a Jewish family. And I just wanted to see this house. It was so important. I, I don't know, I overcome by this desire to see this house. And I knew that it was across the street from a school. And I, I approached this woman eventually, I fled to her. And I ask her, and she leads me to this house, unsure if it's the one that I'm referring to. And she said, you know, I lived in a house next door. And I had a best friend living in this house who was Jewish. And when the Nazis started rallying everyone up from this house to take them into a college to be massacred, 
The Jewish father from that house got over my best friend. His little daughter and said, please save her. Please save her, I beg you. And her father took this little girl for five seconds, and then he gave her back. He said, I can't. I can't take her. And she was killed. And this woman, she starts crying. And she, she cried for hours. And I couldn't console her. I couldn't help her. Because this was the first time in her life she spent years, decades, carrying this grief in her heart. And she couldn't talk about it because the society in which she lived was intolerant to the truth. It was intolerant towards assisting people psychologically, helping them deal with trauma, talking about what actually happened for a balanced reconciliation and a balanced history because it had its own agenda. And I think that that's extremely unjust. And, you know, I think all of these researchers who are doing something are just trying a little bit to help these people in any way they can.